This is Egypt, 1956. These are British paratroopers fighting on the orders of British Prime Minister Anthony Eden. He has gambled on a war in a desperate bid to destroy Egypt's new young president, Gamal Abdul Nasser. I am utterly convinced that the action we have taken is right. This is a war over who will run this Egyptian waterway, the Suez Canal, and the vital oil supplies which are transported through it. Suez is a crisis which will push the world to the brink of nuclear catastrophe. That moment I did think this is really going to be the Third World War. In Britain, we know Suez is a war based on a Prime Minister's lie, a lie which destroys him. They're my six sexed up their intelligence. But seen from the other side, Suez is a story of how a small, poor Arab country defended itself against the Western world and won. People will defend their country, they will defend their land. In February 1955, Egypt's young president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, meets British Prime Minister Anthony Eden for the first time. The two men dislike one another from the start. The impression of President Nasser about Anthony Eden was that he was a small churcher, and not, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> committed with imposing the British point of view on the other side. For Eden, Egypt remains part of Britain's sphere of influence in the Middle East. Although nominally independent since 1922, Egyptian kings have dutifully done what British prime ministers have told them to do. Eden lived in the uh, legend of the empire, but the world was different. Eden didn't realize the change in the balance of power. Anthony Eden is every inch the conservative prime minister. Educated at Eton and Oxford, he was foreign secretary during the war and is Winston Churchill's hand-picked successor. But in NASA, Eden encounters a new kind of Arab leader. He is part of a new generation of Egyptians determined to secure real independence for their country. <laughs> Nasser is one of a group of officers who had overthrown the playboy King Farouk in 1952. Two years later, Nasser had shown Britain that Egypt would not be pushed around. An aggressive guerrilla campaign forces the British to evacuate 88,000 soldiers from the biggest base in the world on the banks of the Suez Canal. At that time, what was most important is real independence and to get free, really free. France agrees to supply Israel with the Jewish state's first jet fighters. To Nasser, it looks like an increasingly powerful enemy is at the gates. The French are giving Israel arms. I am confronting a situation that may distract my country. Should I stand still? So Nasser decides he too will look abroad for arms. As with the loan for his dam, his first call is on the United States. Nasser, from the first day of the revolution, asked the Americans, I need arms. Our army needs arms. And he asked the British the same question. Neither the British nor the Americans gave a response to that. <laughs> But this is the 1950s, the depths of the Cold War. The West and the Soviet Union are locked in a battle for influence across the world. NASA knows that if Washington says no, then maybe Nikita Khrushchev in Moscow will say yes. NASA was an anti-communist. The Soviets knew full well he was an anti-communist. They knew that he was putting communists in jail. Uh, he didn't let those communists out of jail when his relations improved with the Soviet Union. But both sides made a pragmatic decision. We are believers. I am a believer. I believe in God. Nasser used to believe in God. Nasser used to pray. The communists don't believe in God. They don't pray. But in Eden's view, 
NASA does look like a communist stooge. The Prime Minister and the Americans decide to punish him for cutting a deal with the Soviets. Their response is to mount a covert campaign against NASA, codenamed Omega. Omega includes propaganda that provide information to journalists, to broadcasters, that say NASA really isn't a very good person, can you please report this? Omega also includes sanctions against Egypt. It includes blocking military aid to Egypt. Then, as part of this undeclared war, a secret decision is taken to slow down financing on the Aswan Dam. Anthony Eden and the US Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, are behind the new strategy. I think Dulles was angry with Nasser for having almost flaunted his independence. I really think that, that Dulles believed that Nasser's behavior was a, almost a personal affront to him. In London, Eden's mistrust of NASA is increased by some mysterious intelligence reports which have just landed on his desk. They are from an MI6 contact known as Lucky Break. Lucky Break tells Eden that NASA is a pawn of the Soviet Union and the Egyptian people will welcome his overthrow. From reading the reports that MI6 is giving to British officials and giving to the Americans, I think they are taking a few sources and they are sexing them up. No one individual could have provided the information that Nasser was so close to the Soviets, that Nasser was so vulnerable to being overthrown, if not assassinated, because that was not true. That simply was not true. But Lucky Brake is telling the British Prime Minister what he wants to hear. The firm attitude that the government have adopted not Foreign Office Minister Anthony Nutting is one of the first to realize just how far the Prime Minister is now prepared to go. Over an open line, having just said, it's me, but we started a violent argument on the telephone, and he was really violent in that conversation, um, and uh, ended up by shouting at me, I don't want Nasser neutralized, I want him destroyed. There were two, two people with all conversation, Eden and Nutting. Nutting said subsequently that Eden had said murder. Operatives within MI6 take the Prime Minister at his word. What you have is a Thomas Beckett situation where Eden says, will someone not make me rid of this turbulent Nasser? I'm not exaggerating. Nearly every month, nearly every month, there was an attempt against Nasser from the West. Either French or British or Israelis. Nearly every month. As NASA was making a public speech in Alexandria, a young man fired eight bullets at him. All missed the Premier, but two of his aides were wounded. The planes just are, are wildly out of control, putting nerve gas into the ventilation system of NASA's headquarters, trying to put poison into NASA's coffee, trying at some point to uh, possibly uh, shoot NASA. Lucky Break did not exist in 1956. He would have had to be created to justify their extravagant plans to get rid of Nasser. On the 19th of July, 1956, the Egyptian ambassador to the USA is called into the State Department. He is informed that the financing of the Aswan Dam is cancelled. If the West can't assassinate Nasser, then they will destroy his dreams to develop Egypt. To add insult to injury, President Nasser only learns of the decision from the radio news. I was surprised by the insultive attitude which the refusal was declared. Not by the refusal itself but the, the insultive attitude and uh, which meant humiliation. In the stifling July heat, NASA makes his way to Alexandria's Manchia Square, where he is to deliver his speech. 
Once again, his people wait to hear if he will respond to the West's denial of funding for the Aswan Dam. At 9 p.m., NASA climbs the podium. The speech is long. NASA catalogues the centuries of humiliations the Egyptians have suffered at the hands of the West. His tone is measured, but angry. NASA now reveals to the world what the employees of the Suez Canal Company have just discovered. Across Egypt, there is pandemonium. It was a bombshell, of course, absolute bombshell. When we listened to this thing, nobody expected. People were rejoicing in the street. I celebrated with all Egyptians. But Eden has already made his decision. The next morning, uh, Eisenhower had a cable from Eden stating explicitly that the government had decided that they were going to get rid of Nasser, that this was the only alternative, that was a firm decision, they weren't going to change it, and uh, that was that. We all know this is how fascist governments behave. And we all remember only too well what the cost can be in giving in to fascism. Eden's justification for this is the belief that NASA is a Soviet puppet, a direct threat to British interests. Lucky Break's intelligence has told him so. But the intelligence is wrong. In Moscow, Nikita Khrushchev knows nothing of NASA's plans. When he nationalized the uh, canal, uh, it was a surprise for the Soviet Union also. He didn't take the permission or anything. Even once he had made this decision, a few days before the announcement. He didn't tell the Soviets. And he didn't tell them for an obvious reason. He knew what their reaction would be. Moscow would tell him, don't do it. The West saw Moscow as the ginger man in the story, as provoking Nasser to be more and more aggressive. In fact, Moscow was doing the opposite. Fourteen hours later, a ship piloted by an Egyptian has passed successfully through the canal. Once again, there are celebrations in the streets. It is beyond any imagination that give the confidence to the Egyptians that they can do what uh, the whole world thought that they cannot. It is now almost three months since nationalization, and the canal is still open for business. It seems Eden's plans to overthrow NASA and wrestle back control of the canal have failed. The world can see no reason for war. Then, on the 14th of October, two visitors from the French Ministry of Defense arrived to see a gloomy prime minister at his country retreat, Chequers. The French had invented the following scenario. That Israel should attack Egypt. Thereupon, Britain and France, who had forces in the neighborhood, should say, we cannot allow this kind of war because it will interfere with the Suez Canal, and therefore we are going to intervene and hold the two countries apart. I happened to be in Paris. So the Minister of Defense called me in, and he says, did you ever thought storming over Sinai? And that's how it started. Eden is enthusiastic about this French plan, 